that because that, that was brilliant what I just said. Okay. <laughs> what are the lies? Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, what are the lies that Lunch is told in this play? Yeah, Ella. Okay, yeah. She lies about her age constantly. She, so much so that by the end of this play, we don't know what her real age is, right? Um, and like in the last class, someone had this brilliant comment about how Stella is older. Um, and he, he was just like, yeah, and so, you know, then she's not used to this power dynamic with Blanche being her little sister. But we know Blanche is not little sister, right? Like it's, it's Blanche is actually older, but that's so insecure in the play because she's constantly like, she's constantly like, oh, in my, tw I'm 20 or I'm in my 30s. And so much so that you kind of think it, she's probably in her like early 40s is my guess, uh, but it's really hard to tell. Okay, what else does she lie about? Angelina? Yeah, why she was fired, <laughs> why she left the school. Right, she's lying about having a relationship with an underage boy. Yeah, so it's, let's say you're the student, it's really tricky here because Age of consent in New Orleans, and I just looked this up. Age of consent in New Orleans is 17. Oh, um, it would have been 16. 17 back then. Yeah, it's 16 here, isn't it? Um, girls at 16 are too high. Yeah. What? Because women yeah. got married so young, they changed at 16. Oh, wonderful. Anyway, so she, and we wouldn't call her a pedophile because this is such a weird thing to talk about, but um, that technically needs to be somebody who's prepubescent in order to say pedophile. So wait, she's I, into wait. young men, but, hmm? Wait, like, wait, is that like the definition? Wait, wait. Yeah, like, like psychological definition. If you were to go into like the, the what's it called? Not DMV, that's always what I want to call it, but it's the, <laughs> the diagnostic manual. Um, if you were to go into that, it's it, in order to be classified as a pedophile or to have like pedophilic interests, it needs to be creepy about that. Um, so this would be some, something else. Um, not that that makes it right. No. That is the case to me. I, you are not prepubescent. Why, why not? My year filter days, sorry, I'll talk about my year filter days. He's like, wait, you're 17? I thought you were 30. Oh, <laughs> you're just like, oh, uh, <laughs> I'm the growth spurt soon. Um, no, it's, it's, that's important for Blanche's character because we don't want to understand her desire for a young man as being like, um, perverse in the same way right so it's important that we understand that like the relationship would have been absolutely frowned upon but the reason that it would have been frowned upon is because of how old she is not necessarily how young the kid was and also because he was a student so um i think it's just important in 2021 as we're reading the play to understand the differences there not that it was normal it wouldn't have been normal for a teacher to have a relationship with a student right but it's different than if the boy had been 12. Okay. Yeah, Ali. Um, I watched the show and he was told this guy who takes sexual assault by his older female boss. And in return, <clears throat> he starts to uh, he starts to like he like he keeps the little girl in the third grade and he keeps her like all sexual. Uh -huh. And I think Blank is the same way because she wants to do something so traumatic and so adult. She keeps innocence for something younger or like asking us to do anything. Yeah. She knows she's younger. And because she lost her innocence for so long. With her husband particularly, right? Like she had this idealized version of what her married life will be. It did not turn out that way. So she seems to be sort of like stuck in that kind of like maturity level. Yeah. Okay. What else is she lying about? Uh oh, I just wanted to add oh. the young man. Thing. Yeah. Because when that well when the young boy comes to Come over here, young boy. I want to make kiss ya. Right. It's a, a really creepy scene in the movie too. You notice how the the music plays in that scene, and it's kind of like almost like circusy sounding. It's actually the the same um, polka music that plays whenever she's thinking about her husband, and so she sees this young man, and it's like very dark. The shadows are sort of overwhelming everything, and she's like, and yeah, it's like trying to seduce him a little bit, even though he's like a delivery boy. Yeah. Um. Okay, what else is she lying about? Yeah, Judy. Didn't she lie about staying? Yes, good. Um, staying. 
staying at the hotel. Yeah, she's like, oh, that hotel has a bad reputation. No, I never stayed there. And then it comes out that yes, she did. And she like starts to call it the tarantula because she like knows that it has that bad reputation. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else that she's lying about? Oh, I don't drink. Yeah. Or alcoholism. Oh, it's a good sign that I don't know how to spell alcoholic. Um. <laughs> I think there's one more that we want to uh, put up here, which is like her purity um, that she's lying about. She she is acting like, you know, I am, I, I don't know that she directly ever says it, um, but she acts like she's a part of the old traditions, like Mitch calls them. I thought you were a traditional kind of girl. Um, and it is true that she is not. So that kind of goes with the staying at the hotel lie as well. Okay. These are, these are Blanche's lies, right? Um, but when we, so like, it kind of like, if you combine them all together, it kind of like makes up one big lie, I think. So these all feel like little lies, right? That she's telling to deceive people and to get what she wants. But when you put them all together, they kind of create a kind of consistency. Um, she, is old. Well, let's see, where can we start? Let's start with this. All right, so this might be the central quality of her lie, trying to prove that I am a kind of pure person. Um, but like what she what she's lying about here is that she's not a pure person. She has desires. Like she is a person that wants to have sex, basically, right? And she's an old lady, um, and yet she still wants to have sex. Um, so she has to lie then. She wants to have sex, so she stays at the hotel, but she has to lie because she's pure. She uh, drinks alcohol to try to sort of like get out of her own sort of strict rules and her own sort of strict mindset. Um, and that's a, been a kind of lie uh, about being about being pure again. Um, she wants to talk about Shep Huntley coming and, and offering her this sort of like traditional marriage set, right? Um, but he's, he's not there, so she needs to lie about that. Um, she lies about her desires, about why she left the school. So all of these lies, even though they're all sort of separate, they all kind of center around her desire and having to lie about her own desire. Um, so let's think then if that makes her crazy. One, one of these things coming out is going to unravel the whole thing. If it turns out that she that it, it that it's clear that she stayed at this hotel and had intimacies with many strangers, then it's going to come out that she is young or that she's old. It's going to come out that she left the school because of one of these intimacies with many strangers. It's going to come out that Chef Huntley would never want this person. Um, the alcoholism might come out. Like one thing being undone here is going to undo the entire web of the lies. You know, um, so. You tell me, is Blanche crazy? At the end of this, does she belong in a mental institution? Kylie? Um, I think the, the thoughts that she has, like, like everyone wants to seem like they're better than they are, you know, like, like it's normal for people to lie about their age. Um, like, usually they're just saying they're older, you know, to get, like, alcohol or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, like, the, the extent that she takes it to is what really, like, makes her crazy. Mm. So I, I do think she's crazy, but I think that, like, the things that Yes, it does. It's like the things that everyone kind of lies about, um, but she has convinced maybe herself of those lies to a point where it's delusional. Yeah. Other ones? I think that she's not crazy, and like, I, uh, I don't think, I, she's, I think she's just an implicit liar, and she's slowly but deeply, deeper and deeper and deeper, mm -hmm. and she's now too far in to get out at all. Uh -huh. Why is that funny? And like it just really she really just keeps out. I feel like she really just keeps out. She just seems so pathetic. Okay, yeah. So she might be pathetic in the way that she's a compulsive liar, but being a compulsive liar is not a crazy thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's just because she's so 
Chalmers might have been guilty of the use of blood, but has never actually ever received blood. Um, like in the way that she wants. Yeah, or the way that she wants him to do. And that he was there for her every step of the way. She had been trying really hard, but it had never worked out. So why why was she like she keeps on trying? Wasn't she going to kill herself? Okay, you know? so this is where this idea of like the opposite of desire is death. Right? If you stop trying to reach for what you desire, then you are going to die. And yet, um, her desires are the sort of like bedrock for all of her fantasies. So it's like she has desires, like every single person. And I am not just talking about like sexual desires, I'm talking about like you want things in life, you have ambitions, right? To become the person that you want to be. She has desires. And yet, in this sort of system that she's um, bought into in some ways, that she is not allowed to have desire. So she's in this very like, she's in a paradox here. She needs to get what she wants in order to survive and yet she has to lie um, and that then uh, threatens her survival. Ella? Um, I think that she, uh, she's not crazy that she should go to her knees and get help to be able to like learn that, hey, maybe don't lie about your past so much that it becomes back and hurts you. Mm. Because a lot of the filthy liars build their own fantasy like how she does and then we don't know how to get out of it and yeah so if she, she doesn't learn how to get out of it she'll be just as stuck so if we're going to this hospital we can help her get out of it yeah i'm gonna put this up here what would happen to blanche if she stopped lying and i want to come back to that then as a question would that be would that make her more sane yeah, Brooke, and then to Angela. Would you mind So then I'm going to ask these these two questions. Is her belief in the lie, you're saying that her belief in the lie would suggest that she is more insane because she is not self-aware of the way that she's constructing falsehoods, right? But is there a way to think about how if her if she had a full belief in her own lies, that could actually be a way that she is more sane in this play? And I want to I want to come back to that. Angelina? Yeah, yeah, so um, maybe the problem then is not the lies itself, but with other people not helping her uphold the fantasy. Okay, let's get back to some of these questions. So what would happen to Blanche if she stopped lying? I wanna ask that. If she just stopped, okay, so she's like, this is before she went to the mental institution. Here she is in Stella and, and Stanley's apartment. And you know, suddenly she comes home and she's just like, you know what, I'm an alcoholic. I got fired because I uh, tried to seduce one of my students, um, and I let have many intimacies with strangers. What do you guys think? <laughs> you know, like that's how she she comes into the room and she like comes clean. You know, what would happen, Holly Rose? Well, I think like she just has like all these convincing things that she's lying to herself. She's lying in bed about it, and she's like half on it, and she just can't see herself. And so she, if she was truly honest, she's. She is honest at the very end with Mitch, and I think that his reaction at the very end will be the same reaction he would have if he did lie. And that's in the beginning, because she tries so hard to make friends, and then when he breaks and she really needs to know, he yeah. abandons her. So then there's this question of whether or not whether she would inevitably end up end up in the mental institution as well. Um, 
you know, we think that she's probably pretty self-aware, at least before Stanley abuses her. She's pretty self-aware of these lies. She says, I want magic. I don't want realism. And so I am constructing a magical world for you. Um, if she came in and admitted all of this stuff in the 1940s, isn't there still a very good chance that she would end up in the exact same place? Because having the desire at all in the 1940s was a sign of mental instability for women. Um, so for her to kind of construct the fantasy might be a way of self-preservation and not self-destruction. So would, what would happen to Blanche if she stopped lying? Maybe the exact same thing. And that's again, in this way that she's in this sort of like precarious position. And you think of who our writer is here, Tennessee Williams. And you think of the way that Blanche's desires are closeted and the way that Tennessee Williams knew many, many people, himself not one of them, he was um, one, of, one of the very few artists that was openly gay, but many of his friends and many of the people he was dating in the 40s, they were all closeted. Um, and here he is thinking about what happens if you emerge from the closet, what happens when those lies that you've been telling about yourself break down? Would that be an admirable thing to live, you know, your true self um, out in the out in the open world? Or just is the world capable of understanding you and your and your desires? Kylie and then to Ellen. Um so would Blanche kind of be like an ex an extension of Tennessee? Like like kind of you know, I don't like to like go, go go that far into his into his psychology because I didn't know him. You know, I wasn't his yeah. therapist. But it certainly seems, in some ways, like like she is a surrogate. He did have a sister. That sister Rose, who ended up in a mental institution for her schizophrenia, and they lobotomized so that she was easier to deal with. So you might think of Blanche as being a kind of conglomeration of. Tennessee and his sister. Um, but I will say that Blanche Dubois became a uh, a hero, what's the word, an icon for the gay community um, in the 50s and 60s, much like Judy Garland or uh, Lady Gaga now, <laughs> you know. Um, she she definitely like spoke to gay readers in a way that, that resonated. Ella? Um, so with the whole like possibility. Yeah. If she's aware of her fantasy, then at some point the like flowers for the dead, and she's just sitting there like she's going crazy. Yeah. 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 So she definitely in that scene, you're right. She's starting to like it seems like trying it seems like she's starting to mix up the real world, the real world and the fantasy world, right? So then let's talk about this idea. That brings up that idea, the belief in the lie. Okay, it seems pretty clear that believing in your own lies is not sane in the typical way that we think of sanity, because we're like, it doesn't have a connection to the real world. Is there a way that we could think that actually believing in your lies is the same thing to do? Brooklyn? Um, I think it's sort of what you say, sane in the context of that has become integrated <laughs> into your personality and it just becomes you. Happens all the time, right? Yeah, yeah. Jane. <laughs> I don't have a full example, but okay. I spent one time in middle school that I wanted to be president. I mean, I am serious about it, but I think if you were to ask anybody at the school who can say who you would be, that is probably what they would say. Yeah, I'm going to be president someday. Uh, and so even though it seems 
not right now when we all stay home, and there's nothing to guarantee that it's going to happen. It's the number one thing that people know about. Yeah. And it's so, it's totally different. Has that become then a part of your personality where you are like now, yeah, I want to be president. Oh, 100%. I yeah. mean, I always wanted to be president and it, it was always something that people were like fit in. Uh -huh. But now when people are introducing me to other people, they're like, I want to be president. I'm like, I want to be president one day. So then I feel like I have to be that person that's uh -huh. going to be president one day. That's a perfect example of this, yeah. I think. Now, for, for me, <laughs> um, I think that like as a little kid, I kind of, started presenting myself as like the gifted kid, you know? Like <laughs> that's like sort of the, the gifted kid burnout thing is what we're talking about now, right? In pop culture. Um, so like, I kind of was like, no, I'm smart. I'm the kid who reads. I'm the kid who knows about authors. Like I started like trying to like study, you know, different things. And yes, that was an integral part of my personality. Like whatever my DNA says um, kind of, led me or my experiences like my parents read and whatever led me to that personality but once I like fully committed to that personality I wouldn't say that it's like a I wouldn't say it's a lie necessarily but it wasn't an inevitable truth either and because I committed to, to that my series of choices from then on sort of fit with that personality that I sort of built for myself. So I think it's very similar to this president idea, which is that it wasn't like a lie that you wanted to be president of the United States. It was just sort of something that you said, and then it gets like fully integrated into who you are. And now here's this very important part of you that is kind of determining choices that you make. Like I bet some of the reasons that you want to go to Ivy League schools is because you're going to be president of the United States. And do we have a president who didn't go to an Ivy League school? No, so you got to go, you know? Um, so it's like this, this sort of, I guess, recent president. Um, so it's this idea, what is what I'm getting at, is that maybe your whole personality is kind of a lie uh, in the way that it, it is something that you kind of build for yourself. It's an, and if we want to say lie sounds so negative, right? So maybe we can say it's an act of creation. You've made, you have created yourself and you've created yourself to be this consistent person that other people can interact with, with then in a way that is comfortable for other people, where now they know this thing about Jaden that she wants to be the president. They know kind of how to treat her in some ways as not a president. <laughs> Ella? Um, That's what I'm going to call you. I think one. the prime example I use, which I think is real, like, so it's like, oh, it's going to be like, is I'm a very introverted person. But I'm so secure about being introverted. Like, I like to be alone and, like, in my room. Uh -huh. But I like other people to see that I'm an extrovert, so I'm louder. Mm. <laughs> and then I like to, like, you know, hang out with people and make them feel like, oh, yeah, she's an extrovert because I don't want them to feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. So if you started then to feel more extroverted, if you were like one night home on Friday night, and you're like, I shouldn't be here. I should be hanging out with people. That's a way then that it would become more integrated into your personality. And you can kind of like change that. And what happens then is that if you have any moments where you don't behave that way, you, you kind of conceal them. I have many moments where I am very stupid. <laughs> I have no common sense. Um, I have many moments where there are things that I should have read or I should be familiar with and uh, I'm not. And so I just sort of like pretend that I am, you know, like I'll have a student come up and want to talk about war and peace and I've never read war and peace, but maybe I might say, I haven't done it with this, but maybe I might sort of like go with what I know about war and peace to try to construct that vision of myself, right? I have all sorts of moments where I am stupid, but I don't come into here into this room and tell you so much about the moments when I am stupid because I'm trying to present as this really smart person. So is that a lie? Because I haven't come and reveal, revealed to everybody that that I'm an, an idiot, <laughs> secretly an idiot. <laughs> I think a lot of times like when we have those moments, like that we don't want to be like the stereotype that we set for ourselves mm -hmm. um like a lot of times for me i'll just like be quiet like um a lot of times because i'm taking ap music theory and i have some friends who like know like every keyboard that makes them identify as being just like that and so i was just kind of like very just like i don't want to guess because then that kind of reveals that like even though i love music i'm not like super knowledgeable uh -huh. or like i've studied all this stuff so i just like don't say anything then maybe people will 
Yeah. Right, right. So it's like this idea, you have like some imposter syndrome there, right? Where probably those same people have tons of things where they do the same thing, right? Where they're quiet when something's being presented because they don't want to seem like they're the ones who don't know things. So in some ways, I am so envious then of the people who aren't aware of those discrepancies. Um, the people who, they might say idiotic things all the time, <laughs> but they still go through the world thinking, I am the smartest person in this room, you know? And they kind of like, they don't recognize then when they're being idiotic. And that would be, I think, this idea of stability or instability or sane or insane. They don't recognize that maybe their persona of being a smart person is in some ways a lie, has some breaks in it, um, has some moments where it is not truth, and yet they fully ignore those things and can believe in their constructive personality. Um, so in, in that way, like, yeah, I, I, maybe they are a little insane. Maybe they are a little in, in, out of touch with reality and their narcissist and whatever. But I am kind of envious of that stability, of that stable construction they've made. Ali Rosen then developed. Um, okay, so I, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, I think it's like so funny because I really badly wrote things. Like, usually, like, like I'll be like, I, I can't tell anymore because I'm still cracking that lie if I'm trying to get someone to care about me because I just want to give them love or if I'm actually really, really bad. And so, like, um, yeah, or if I'm, yeah, if yeah I'm, you just want people, more people to kind of have power over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like that sort of person thing, it's like how does your character gain power? And your emotional manipulation is how Blanche gained power, but no one allows her to do that. And her, um, her, I think that she just, I think that she could be so profoundly not insane, but just insane in like everyone else's eyes. See what everyone else can by getting people to care about them. Mm. Like everyone else can get what she wants. She's just bad at it. And yeah, and everyone else is able to hide their um, insanity better, and that's what makes her seem more insane. Right. Okay, good. So let's think about what lies Stanley tells us. Because if that's true, then it's not just Blanche who is lying. Right? So what lies does Stanley tell in this play? Yeah. Maybe uh, I'm not abusive. Yeah, what else? Brooklyn? Yeah. Yeah, so he straight up lies to her. Um, what else does he lie about? Very importantly here at the end. In the movie, he says, I never touched her. But in the play, he just, yeah, it seems implicit. Lies about the rape. How about um, he, he is lying, what about more socially? Like lying maybe about how uh, women don't, have as much mm, importance or power as men. I think lies about how much he loves public things. Loves to go down to it. So he lies about some kind of love and what love could mean to him. Yeah, um, he maybe uh, lies about the realities of being a second generation immigrant. There are all sorts of lies that Stanley is participating in. And yet when we think about this play, we think of Blanche being the liar, don't we? Is, is that fair to say? And Stanley being the one who is, you know, empirically 
he, he understands things empirically and pragmatically, so he seems closer than to the truth. Um, but just because everybody believes his lies, just because he's able to uphold these lies, does not mean that he is any less of a liar than Blanche is. And what I want to think about here is this idea. So uh, our examples about like wanting to be president or wanting to be to appear smart, those seem like things that you can easily lie about because they don't have um, anything like physical reality associated with them as much. Like it's easy to sort of like talk through, <laughs> talk over any inconsistencies and prove to everybody else that it's consistent. What about the idea of uh, virginity? I'm gonna close the door. It's a weird, weird thing for somebody to walk by. Um, that makes it seem like it's like lurid. It's not, but like, yeah. Um, in some ways, this is kind of gross, but I know a lot of men tend to be like, if they're, she's not a virgin, I'm not going to have sex with her. Uh -huh. And, but men can go around and have sex with whoever they want, and they, they're still like, I'm fine. But women have to be pure, and to kind of be, Blanche wants to, has these desires of wanting sex. Mm -hmm. So to obtain sex, she has to put up a front that she is a virgin and that she is very pure because that's what men want. Yeah, so it's again this like kind of paradox of her desire, right? She desires things. She's supposed to be desirable to men, and yet she is not supposed to have ever desired anything before in her life in order to be desirable. Um, and it puts her in this impossible situation. Now, is lying about, so, okay, I lie about being smart but I can cover it up because it's an abstract concept. Is virginity an abstract concept? Yeah. In what way? As a way to like judge a woman's worth, I guess. Okay. Like, like having having your D card, you know, mm -hmm. like it, it, I get it, like kind of gives off vibes of like being property, you know, and owning property, that's what people want to okay. have. And so like, like women still having their D card is like, like something they just like take care of themselves, and it seems that would get taken away, you know. So they I, need somebody to sort of take yeah. care of them for them. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So it has this historical, this historical importance where um, it maybe was used as a way of like property. Um. You know, this is a, a new person that you can have. <laughs> And you can own. Oh, um, new cars. Yeah, exactly. New it's not. It's not used in the cars. same way. Um, the other thing, though, to point out here is that even the idea of virginity is not secure. And at different points in history, different kinds of acts have been considered virginity versus not virginity. Does that make sense? Without going into details, and so there is a way that she should be able to construct this idea of virginity, even though it seems like it's more associated with physical reality, where you're like, well, you're either a virgin or you're not a virgin, right? Um, if you lie about that, then you are detached from reality. But there is a way that even that concept can be um, manipulated and created by other people and by the self. So by Blanche saying like, no, I am, I am a pure kind of lady, I am a virgin, I am worthy of being desired and being married because of this. Is that any more insane than Stanley's version of, of the truth? Okay, Ella. Um, with the like whole thing of like men being accused of having a virgin, it's also like, yeah, there's a physical way to tell only once though, and men don't even care enough to even learn about that. Mm -hmm. And so why does it even matter? Because it, it's almost like the whole point of virginity is to tell them that they're not allowed to have desires to want more unless they have a man to do things that they want. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then it's like, you're taught that from a young age, like Virgin Mary, even though she wasn't a virgin, and that was never in the Bible or anything, but they cr men created it once they translated it years later again. I don't know enough about biblical history to comment on that, but <laughs> it's like so upsetting because I remember learning about that and being like, so we're just telling women if they're not a virgin, they can't be holy, but she wasn't a virgin. It was never actually in the Bible. Well, it's the Catch-22 of Eve, too. Um, yep, she in had order sex to be, In order to be holy... Then you can't make children, but you are supposed to make children in yeah. order to be holy. Yeah. Yeah. And um, like the whole thing where she partook of the apple was actually not her eating an apple off a tree. It was actually her having sex with Satan, and then they all fell. And that's why. Again, I don't know anything yeah, about yeah. And then history. Abel and I won't Cain, be able to Abel and Cain were the brothers, but one of them was Satan, and was was like born as Satan. The other one was born to Adam, and so that's why God didn't like one more. I have way into this, but 
let me bring it let me bring it back to a more comfortable area for, for belief systems. A lot of our belief systems are based on female purity. Um, you know, the King Arthur story with Guinevere is a story based on Guinevere losing purity. Um, the uh, the Narcissus and Echo, like there's just, the, there's a bunch of them. <laughs> All of the Greek myths are based on purity. So a lot of like our belief structures and our mythical structures are based on this idea of women being in this catch-22 position. Yeah, Kylie. Um, I think so. Just hold on. So, like, women are supposed to have like no desires and supposed to be pure and virgins until marriage. Um, but like on the other hand, um, like women think they have to be like promiscuous in order to get the right one. Um, to quote, to quote my mother, um, um, women give sex to get love, and then men give love to get sex. Mm. And so, like, your mother says that to you. Yeah, no, so she tells that to me. She tells me that every day. It's on a pillow. And so, So now she's tried it another way, and she is still not wanted in the way that she wants to be wanted. Um, yeah, Ali Rose. Um, oh, Stanley, like he was Oh no, he would lie to all. I think he was because at the very end, after like the couple of her that admit that he was doing that to get the place with her. Yes. Um, he was lying to women. Yes. I think that if he was surrounded by like all his guys, all of the poker, he would tell them. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's telling me that. Because he doesn't need them to uphold he needs a lie. purity line. in front of yeah. women, but he doesn't need the purity in front of men. Yeah. And I think it's the same for women. I think it's like, oh, but like women are supposed to be like, we need to be more pure around the women. Or like, that's we can be like both. So it's the way that gender fantasies are upholding each other too, mm -hmm. that they can't exist. The fantasy that can't and doesn't have to exist separately. It's just the intermingling of the fantasy that when men are around, you have to uphold the fantasy versus when women are around. Mm -hmm. Let's think about this question then, because this is where I want to end it. Um, <laughs> I talked way more. Didn't I say 15 minutes yeah. for this discussion? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that sounds like me. Um, so let's talk about the end then, because this is such a horrible scene. Uh, let's actually look at it. So this is on page 162. Mm, let's go 161. And the way that Stanley says it is, I'll interfere with you. You think I'll interfere with you? Ha ha. And then he says, come to think of it, maybe you wouldn't be bad to interfere with. And I think that word interfere is uh, really telling here. Sometimes I think in movies, so this, these days we are doing far more, a far better job with representation of these kinds of scenes than we did in the past. In the 40s and 50s, the movies that you would see that include scenes like this, they'd be rare, um, but like, well, 50s and 60s, often uh, a rape would be motivated by passion in the film. So you'd watch it and you'd be like, well, this guy just can't control himself and it's awful, but you know, this is, this is part of like his sort of desire as a man. And so he can't, you know, he can't control it. That's what makes men dangerous. But when he says interfere, how is that different? Than passion. Yeah. Because that shows that he is aware that she is okay. Okay, good. So he is aware of the fact because he says interfere. I am here. I am going to like mess with you, right? I'm going to mess up 
like whatever you have going on in your construction of yourself, I'm going to interfere with that. And I know that you don't want me to. So I think that that's really important here. This isn't a question of consent or like, you know, well, you know, uh, he said, she said, we, we don't know what he was thinking or what she was thinking. No, we know exactly what he, that he knows what he's doing. Kylie? Um, and it, so the way he says like interfere, um, it shows or like, it feels like he's doing it for power. Like he's only doing it in order to like, like mess up your life and kind of like, like it kind of sounds like he doesn't want to do it either, but like it's a sense of like, oh, I can do this. So yeah. I will. Yes. Okay. So that then suggests to me that Stanley feels like he's out of power. Um, that he, when he interacts with Blanche, doesn't have the power he is used to having when he interacts with everybody else. What's that? I wanted to add on to that another thing. Is when he kind of represents the partiality, and he shows that that he desires to overcome Blanche and his hopes for like whatever hopes he stole over my identity. Mm -hmm. So like if he gets possessed. Now I'm going to need to confront him to represent your reality, even if it means you don't want to. Yeah. So there's twisted ways of being a power. Both for his own mind and for his own pleasure. Yes. He, I think, and I think it goes further than that because I think we've shown that Stanley is committed to as much of a fabrication of reality as Blanche might be. And so he's forcing her to understand the world in the way that he understands the world. Um, he's like, you don't get to live in your constructive fantasy anymore because here I am and I'm going to interfere with that constructive fantasy. So the tragedy here is maybe not that Blanche lies so much and that Blanche, Blanche is this, this broken person who can't tell the difference between fantasy and reality. Maybe the tragedy is that there are all, all of us are living in fantasies. None of us have a real access to what reality is without social structures and without power structures and class and gender structures. And the tragedy here is that some people's fantasy gets to overcome other people's fantasies. Um, and, and that those fantasies then uh, for some people can be so easily broken. Maybe, maybe. Um, is there anything else I wanted to say? With, oh, one thing I think that's really important about that is you said the pull the wool over the, his eyes, right? And the way that he says that, I think is telling, he says, you never pulled the wool over this boy's eyes. And he like references his gender when he's saying that, because it's like, I am a boy, I am a man, I, I am a male. And so you as a female are not going to control what my version of reality is. Okay, what do you think about that? Any, any other comments about it? Okay. So I absolutely talked way too much and we're not going to be able to have much of a conversation. So instead, I am going to focus your attention on certain passages from the book that I want you to find, I want you to ask questions about because your prompt for the essay, I don't know if I read it to you, did I? Yeah, okay. So the prompt for the essay is about finding a central question in the story. And you're finding that through the point of view of a character. So you're saying like, okay, my character that I'm committed to talking about in this paper is Blanche. So what is a central question in this play that deals with Blanche? Um, how can I arrive at a theme, a theme about the play that deals with Blanche? Make sense? Kind of? Okay, so I'm gonna point you to a couple passages that I think are going to be helpful for finding those questions. Page 92 to 95. I'm not gonna write page every time. That would be too much. <laughs> okay, so take out um, a piece of paper for this, or yeah, there isn't any room on the pink piece of the paper. So take out a piece of paper. This is gonna help you when you're writing that that um, essay. You don't have to choose a question that you write in this class but it would save you a bunch of work if you did choose it. So you're gonna to go to these passages. So like, let's go to 92.95. And this is uh, the top, it starts right at the top of 92. What I think is important is this idea of never being hard or self-sufficient enough. When people are soft, soft people have to shimmer and glow that little section. Um, so you would then read through that section and you will write a question, a central question 
about that little section. So like in this section, I might say something about, My question might be something about is a self-constructed fantasy destined to fall apart and fail? It's this broad kind of question. It's still specific enough to get at an interesting theme, but it's not just about Blanche or just about Stanley and Rich and so on. Okay. I do think it might be helpful to do this in uh, pairs or groups if you want to, but I'm just going to leave that up to you. If you want to work together, you can, and if not, just you can work by yourself. But um, I'm going to give you the rest of class to try and think of good central questions for each of those passages.